Hi again, it's Leah from Teen Defenders. In my past few videos, I've been discussing a number of issues that are important to consider when discussing the issue of abortion. I've discussed the issue of choices. We live in a free society, but still, choices are restricted all the time. The law restricts choices that have a negative impact on someone else. It's clear that the choice to have an abortion has a negative impact on the unborn, but somehow our society seems to have determined that taking the lives of the unborn is inconsequential. Was this determination based on truth? Or is it simply a case of our society preying on the defenseless? To answer this question, I spent the next two videos analyzing both the humanity and personhood of the unborn. I concluded that the unborn are definitely human and cannot rationally be denied personhood. Still, there are those who have questions about abortion when it comes to what is known as the hard case categories. Many people believe that abortion is wrong in most circumstances, but they struggle with the issue when it comes to a woman being impregnated through rape or incest. Should an exception be made in these circumstances? This is a good question, and it's what I'll be discussing in this video. Before I start, though, I want to say that I recognize that this is a sensitive topic. Rape and incest are terrible violations. As with other victims of crime, those who've experienced sexual abuse suffer deep loss. I have no intention of hurting or condemning any woman who has gone through an experience like this. The last thing that sexually abused women need is more disrespect. What happened to them isn't their fault and shame has no place in their lives. Still, this conversation needs to happen. We need to be able to discuss the issue of abortion resulting from rape or incest for the benefit of the abused women, for the benefit of the unborn, and for the benefit of society. For the rest of the video, I'm only going to be talking about raped women, but please know that I'm referring to women who have been victims of either rape or incest. First, let's look at some stats. Although the first argument that people raise in defense of abortion is rape, like I've mentioned in previous videos, only 1% of all abortions are hard case categories. This includes rape, incest, and the life of the mother being in danger. So using the what if a woman was raped argument is not a justification for abortion on demand. Abortion on demand advocates argue that a woman has a right to have an abortion for any and every reason be it for rape, gender selection, or simple convenience. So, as Scott Klusendorf says, using the context of rape to try and prove that abortion should be legal in all cases is intellectually dishonest. The next step that we'll look at is what decision women actually make in situations of rape and incest. According to a study done by Dr. Sandra Mackhorn, approximately 75 to 85 percent of women, after being sexually assaulted, decided not to have an abortion. Several reasons were given for their decision. First, around 70 percent of women felt that to have an abortion would only be another act of injustice against their bodies and against their unborn child. Second, Many of the women believed that their child's life had some sort of intrinsic meaning or purpose, despite the fact that he or she was brought into their lives through a horrible act. They understand that good can come from evil. Third, victims of assault often have a heightened sense of the value of life and a heightened sense of respect towards others. Having been victimized themselves, the thought that they in turn might victimize their own innocent child through abortion is repulsive to them. Fourth, victims of rape can get a sense of empowerment by carrying their pregnancy to full term. At some level, she will have conquered the rape. Giving birth, especially when conception was not desired, is a selfless way for her to display courage, strength, and honor. It is proof that she is better than the rapist. While he was selfish, she can be generous. While he was destructive, she can be life-giving. In contrast, many raped women report that the abortions felt like a degrading and brutal form of medical rape. Some stated that the abortion felt even more violating than the rape. This is not surprising. Research has shown that women who have abortions often experience feelings of guilt, depression, resentment towards men, 
lowered self-esteem, and the feeling of being dirty. These are extremely similar to the feelings expressed after having been raped. What these facts show is that abortion does not fix the rape situation. In fact, it only worsens it and places the woman in a more difficult situation than she was in before. But some people may argue that, despite the facts, abortion should still be an option that is made available to raped women. They'd say that a raped woman should be able to make her own choice, that it should be her decision whether or not she carries a child to full term that was conceived through such violating circumstances. Who are we to force upon her the requirements to carry a rapist's child? That child will be a constant reminder of the rape and may cause her constant emotional distress. That's a good question. Before I venture a response, however, let me begin by describing a scenario. Let's say that there's a married couple and they've been trying to have a child and they have intercourse, say, on a Tuesday. But on the Wednesday, the woman is raped. Upon examination, the doctor discovers that the woman is pregnant. Because she and her husband have been trying to have a baby, the woman wants to keep the child, if it belongs to the husband. Let's say for the sake of illustration that she is unable to determine whether or not the child was conceived through rape or conceived through intercourse with her husband. In the end, she decides to keep the child. Now, let's say that after the baby is born, it becomes obvious that the child is not the husband's. It's the rapist's. Now, the woman doesn't want the rapist's child. That child will be a constant reminder of the terrible violation. Just looking at the baby causes her terrible emotional distress. Should she be allowed to kill that baby? I have no doubt that the answer coming from every rationally minded person is no. Or let's say that the woman already knows that the child was conceived through rape, but she decides to try and do the right thing and keep the baby. But then, after two years of emotional torment, she just can't take it anymore. The child looks more and more like the rapist every day. Just looking at the child reminds her of the horrific rape. Should she be allowed to kill the child then? Again, the answer that would come from every rationally minded person is no. In the cases I just described, the child's right to life will always trump the woman's rights. You see, even though the baby was conceived through rape, once it's born, we all recognize that he or she has value and rights. Being conceived through rape doesn't take away her intrinsic value. Being a product of rape doesn't make him less of a human or less of a person, and we cannot deny him his rights. So why is it different for the unborn? It really all goes back to the same point. If the unborn are human, if they're persons, there really can be no justification for taking their lives. And if you're struggling with the questions on the humanity and personhood of the unborn, I invite you to take a look at my previous videos. A baby conceived through rape is not at fault. He or she should not be blamed for the violator's crime. If a raped woman cannot kill her rapist, why do we think that it's justifiable for her to kill her innocent unborn child? Any time a crime is committed, there is always a loss, whether it be the loss of property in the case of theft, the loss of a loved one in the case of murder, or the losses of hopes, dreams, and physical security in the case of a woman impregnated through rape. But committing an another injustice is not the solution. It can never make up for the losses incurred. For sure, going through with the pregnancy will cause the woman to suffer, even though she would be doing the right thing. Like Scott Klusenor says in his book, The Case for Life, Sometimes the right thing to do isn't the easiest thing to do. But thankfully, the woman doesn't need to suffer alone because there are pregnancy care centers that are ready to help her. If our desire as a society is to do what's best for raped women, we wouldn't be offering them abortion as an option. Abortion only hurts them and violates their bodies yet again. Instead, we should be offering them emotional, physical, and financial support. We should be showing them that we care about their emotions by helping them work through the pain, by teaching them about the empowerment that comes through forgiveness, and by sharing with them the experiences of other women who overcame the rape by giving life to another.